this photo, um, especially some of you folks that aren't from the Bay Area, you may not know me or have seen me yet. So hello, welcome. We're really excited to have you here. And this is one of my favorite topics. Like I'm stoked today um, because first of all, I love the history of photography. I think we all have something obviously to learn from history, but especially um, through through the eyes of, of our predecessors, through the people who have paved the way um, for women in this industry who've been so influential. Um, in the Bay Area, we're really, really lucky um, because we have a very long history um, of women in photography. The Imogen Cunningham is is like my one of my favorite examples of that, but of course, Dorothea Lang as well. Um, but I, Ron Partridge was a longtime customer of Looking Glass. I actually was his assistant. He is the son of Imogen Cunningham, assistant to Dorothea Lang and Ansel Adams. And so, you know, examining that history and, and playing a, a role within it is, is one of my favorite things to do. It's how we get better at what we do is by looking back at what's been done. So Jared, I'm stoked that you are here and doing this and managed to put this together. We haven't done any history lessons. And so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to it. Um, and if anybody has questions about the store, feel free to reach out in the chat. Um, and if you have questions that you wanna ask today, Put them in the chat because we are asking everybody to stay muted um, and their video turned off to make sure everything goes smoothly. But we'll try to address every single question that comes up. All right, guys, I'm going to turn that over to Jared. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Holy smokes. Uh, I've taught this class almost 20 times and I promise you that is the best intro I've ever had because most times people aren't as excited about art history as I am. So <laughs> thank you for that. I greatly appreciate that. Uh, and she's totally right, guys. The reason I created this class, uh, besides the very obvious one of just needing to put a spotlight on women, uh, was that, look, I spend half my year on the road traveling. Uh, I get to meet many of you across the country. And in my personal time, I've been very lucky. Uh, I've traveled to 27 countries and I've gotten to live in four. So I am used to continually moving. And with all this lockdown fun stuff, you know, it became a, a, a big attempt to not turn into the furniture. And while I knew a lot of people in the industry were going to give uh, classes on, hey, how to use this gear, how to get this macro shot or things of that nature, um, that's not really what I wanted to do with this. I wanted to spark some creativity and get some things going. So that is kind of how I came to do this. Um, let me share my screen real quick and I'll give a little bit deeper explanation. Let's do that. All right. Now I do this. Okay. So we already know who I am. Don't worry about me. That's not what we are here for. <clears throat> We're here for the subject of women in photography. And I do have a few caveats that I have to explain first and foremost. Um, some people get confused. Why is there a guy doing this? Uh, I, I work with a woman who, uh, sorry, I am married to a woman who works in a 92% uh, a male dominated field. So the concept of, you know, women not getting a spotlight is something that I have to watch or help her deal with all the time. Um, and the same time I've, I, I go to try work trade shows. I see what the industry is like. And, and sometimes photography has not been, uh, photographers have not been the kindest to women in the industry. So I was really, really excited about doing this. The second caveat is that uh, I, might have bitten off more than I can chew. If the subject of women in photography is a 50 megapixel sensor, I'm not even giving you half a pixel, okay? Um, I could do one of these a month for the next 10 years of my life and still barely scratch the surface of the, the concept and the idea of what women have done in photography, what they have brought to the table for the rest of us and the, the amazing amounts of creativity that they've pushed out into the world. Um, so, with that, I'm not here to mansplain the subject. Every woman you're going to see here today was actually put forward by women that I either work with at Tamron or that I respect in the industry that I reached out to and said, hey, who are the women that have affected you when you were studying or when you were uh, uh, you started out in your industry or now, et cetera, who affects you, you know, mentally or photographically? You know, there's all kinds of different ways this, this can occur. And I was very thankful. Uh, all the women that I love and respect in the industry were excited to hear me doing something like this and they really wanted to help. And so when we get to the two women, um, I will clearly point them out, but otherwise these are all put forward by women, some of which you will learn about today. So with that, I'm going to jump in. 
So the women who got us started, um, that's a touchy subject, right? How did we really get started? Because it's touchy because we don't really know. Uh, Sarah Ann Bright was a young woman in the United Kingdom, and we didn't really know who she was until 2015. Um, Constance Fox Talbot, for those who do know their photographic history, is the Fox Talbot name is something that comes with the essentially the birth of photography. And that was one of the first fun surprises I discovered in putting this together. I never thought of a tag team husband and wife duo in the early 1800s, the beginning of photography, um, doing these things. So I was, I, I really, I got excited by that. And then Julia Margaret Cameron is someone who gets us to later in the 1800s before we end up turning and uh, coming across into the turn of the century. So who is what, where did Sarah come from? All of this, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the two mysteries that are in today's program. On the right-hand side, you see, see the Quillen leaf. Um, the Quillen leaf went up for auction in New York in 2015. Um, as with most pieces of art these days, provenance uh, being shown for what is on sale is a big deal. And so uh, there was some discrepancies. Uh, the auction house wanted to know a little bit more about it. So it's not just calling in photographic historians, they called in, uh, you know, people who work in uh, biology, arboretums and things like that to assess this leaf and where could this leaf have grown, et cetera, et cetera. On the back are a couple inscriptions that um, most people in the beginning of, of this, uh, of this, uh, the Quillen Leaf's life, I should say, most people thought it was attributed to one of two British gentlemen. Uh, and with all these discoveries, it, it wasn't. It was Sarah Ann Bright. So who was she? We know very little about her. Her father was uh, a banker in the United Kingdom, and he made a good deal of money. And what he did with his money was he put it into the sciences of the day. And so I could see where it'd be a little easy if his, his young daughter comes to him and says, hey, I hear about this photography thing. I want to give it a shot. And so uh, they jump into it. And that is kind of all we know about Sarah Ann Bright, unfortunately. Whereas the name, as I said, Constance Fox Talbot is something that we kind of know of. Now, I, you know, I said this was interesting to me because this is early in, in photography. And let's be really clear what early in photography means. This means you are hand mixing your own chemicals, which are extraordinarily caustic, way more than anything we know today. You are building your own cameras out of wood, brass, and glass. That's what this husband and wife duo were doing. Uh, I don't know if they ever had children. Um, I don't, for some reason, I don't think they did. But they worked together. And this is the only remaining portrait of Constance here on the left. Now, she was known for a few of her portraits, one being the Irish poet Thomas More. And that's not uncommon. Um, if you think about the uses of photography in the mid 1800s to the, the, you know, the later part of the, the mid 1800s, a lot of times we were documenting uh, criminals. We were documenting people with mental diseases and things like that before they were being shipped off to sanitariums. Um, and the only other people doing things besides the police with photography were, were people that were actually trying to, uh, how do I explain it? Document, uh, the easiest way sometimes I think of it as things for books. At this time, you know, we had little pocket books because there was no television, there was no radio. So what did we do with all these these little books, they only had engravings where people might want to start putting pictures in there of whether the people who wrote them or pictures that might describe what it was that was actually going on in the book. So by the time we get to Julia Margaret Cameron, this can be really well seen and understood. Um, this is Alfred, uh, Lord Alfred Tennyson, Alfred Lord Tennyson on the left here. I always goof up his name. I'm dyslexic every time I try to say it. Uh, he is the first poet laureate of the United Kingdom. Now, on the right-hand side, what we see is a, a, a more kind of understood concept, work concept of what Julia would produce. It's these ethereal photographs kind of sum up this mythology or, or pictures that you could genuinely really see being part of a book or a description, just like this one on the right of this lovely young cherub. Um, so it's this soft focus and this wonderful feel that the end of the 1800s and the early 1900s was known for, not only in Europe, but leading all the way over uh, to New York and the beginning of advertising photography at that time in New York City studios and galleries with people like Alfred Stieglitz. Um, 
arguably one of her more famous portraits as well is who you see here on the left hand side and that is uh, Sir Charles Darwin. One of the things I really appreciate about Julia is how she was able to I mean, I think this is, as photographers, what any of us would want to do, be able to make money from our portraits of these famous people weaving in and out of, you know, this, this wonderful lifestyle so that we could afford to take the pictures that we want to on this right-hand side. I mean, that is the way many of us still function today within the industry. So with that, that kind of gets us up into the... Uh, the turn of the of 1900s essentially is what we're doing. And the 1900s, there's some changes that begin to happen, right? We got, we have the roaring twenties, we have World War I, and then we have World War II. And in between there here in the United States, we also had the Great Depression. So the people we're about to see, those are the things that affected them and made them who they are, or, or maybe why their styles of photography were so accepted or wanted at the time. In my research, I found this advertisement from Kodak. It kind of surprised me uh, as the earliest advertisement I can think of, of, of anyone advertising specifically to a woman. And I love everything about this. Uh, if you look in the center of the frame, you see this young gentleman who has a, uh, a fish that arguably any of us would be very pleased to bring home to our family. Um, any of your friends might be jealous that you have a fish that, that large, but this, this young man doesn't care about that whatsoever. His eyes are glued to this girl, and it's not because she's a girl. He's not gawking at her. He wants to know what is this piece of technology in her hand that is now more important than the food that I'm trying to put on my table or my family's table. Uh, he is enthralled. And I can kind of hope or I like to think that the young gentleman on the right is yelling across the river or down the river to his friends to, hey, come see what this girl's got. Like, this is really crazy because the only piece of technology that is in this picture belongs to the young woman. And I think that's a pretty powerful thing that, that I hope was realized at that time in 1918. So very big thank you to Jennifer because that introduction was right on the spot. Imogene Cunningham was one of the first uh, nine members of the group of F-64 that started in San Francisco. And their goal was to get out of that New York and that, um, especially New York, but th that also was left over from Europe, that soft focus, uh, you know, the ethereal mythological looking uh, kind of shot. And let's, let's leave that to the arts. Let's leave that to painting and graphic design. We are photographers, we are technicians. And so we want to work with what is the uh, strictest interpretation. So if you look in the center here, what we see is this beautiful still light, um, amazing use of light color, tone, and sharpness. And you see the same thing with the picture on the right-hand side too. Um, that is the famous painter Frida Kahlo. One of the things that was nice about the group of F64, um, as Jennifer already pointed out, we're talking Edward Weston, Imogen Cunningham, Ansel Adams, and a few others that are more than famous in their own right. Um, they had this luxury of, first of all, wanting to give the finger to the East Coast and say, hey, we're not like you. And secondly, being the wide west being open as open as it was, uh, anybody who's lived on both coasts knows that the sun, the sun going down in Los Angeles or San Francisco is different than the sun coming up in Boston or New York or DC. So they had this beautiful sunset every night with the beautiful dust in the air, creating all these wonderful colors and things of, of that nature. At the same time, they've got all these um, beautiful vegetables and things that are growing because this is the time California is kind of becoming a, a breadbasket of America, uh, the juggernaut that it is today. And so they would transit from San Francisco down into northern Mexico to meet people like Frida Kahlo and hang back and forth, and then maybe over to Arizona and New Mexico, and then back up into San Francisco. And these people would stay with each other and help each other out and, and just function a creative force and fashion with each other which is why they became so powerful as the group of F-64. Now, just because they wanted to shoot nice and tight and uh, you know sharp doesn't mean they weren't always a little soft focus. This is one of her works as well on the left that she's quite known for too. But this is where we see this transition or this split in photography from what is uh, sharp focus and what is soft focus. So Dorothea Lange, as, as we were talking about earlier, she holds an amazing piece, not only in, in photographic history and women's photographic history, but also in the history of the United States of America. 
She was part of the Farm Security Administration, which was an initial group of 12 photographers hired by the FSA to travel across the United States during the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl to see what was out there, what was going on, and to send those photographs back to the government. And then eventually those, gov those pictures would be shown to people. So they could kind of understand and see what was going on around the country at this time. Uh, you know, these are these are images that you would have, or if we were alive at the time, we would have had the luxury of seeing things like Life magazine. So on the left, the picture you see is not uncommon of her work, right? There's a lot of sadness. And I, I want to be honest if anybody wasn't aware of that already, because we're seeing people at their least. This woman is in this van because she lives in this van. All right, or truck is what it is. It's an old fruit truck. Um, and she's got at least two children, which you can see. But if you look at her, she's a little forlorn, all right? But there's still a strength in that photograph. Uh, there's still a strength in her as a subject. And she doesn't necessarily look that beaten down. And that's something that I appreciated because even though these people had nothing and many of them were really, really down and out, she still could show that without demeaning them. And I really appreciated that about her eye and what she did. This young woman in the photograph on the right was quoted as saying, um, I think I've got it a little easier, or we, her and her partner, um, got a little easier than some of the others because we're not carting around all these kids. This is uh, her little tent in what was a, a citrus orchard, and they would go pick citrus fruits for the season. Now, this picture here is arguably one of her most famous. And it had previously been on the the page before until just a couple of weeks ago, I was looking at some personal art news and stuff. And I came across the picture on the right hand side. And this is the original proof from the FSA. And I wanted to, obviously the picture was in here. I wanted to show you, but I also want to show you a difference of what really happens in, in a physical print versus well, a digital image. Uh, they don't always line up perfectly, right? They do the same thing, but there's a different feeling. There's a different emotion that might come across in these. All right. And there's obviously the, the uh, how do we say it? The uh, issue of time, right? That photographic print will show time. A digital image doesn't. It is what it is. But I just wanted to, to let you show those to you so everybody could kind of have a clear view of that. So Elizabeth Lee Miller is actually one of my two uh, entries into this program. My background is photojournalism. Uh, I studied photojournalism at uh, RMIT in Melbourne, Australia. And I, being a foreigner, I spent a lot of time in the library. I, I loved Australia, don't get me wrong, uh, but I loved reading photographic books when I was in the throes of collegiate study. And so I would read, you know, somewhere between five to 10 photographic books a week. And when I would when I learned of Lee Miller, I, I got very blown away. Um, she's originally from New York. Her, she had a brother who was a photographer, a brother who was a pilot and enjoyed photography as well. Um, from that, she started modeling. And when she was young, she moved down to, to New York and had a bad life experience, shall we say, that kind of changed her. One afternoon, she was sitting on 6th Avenue about to try and cross. She stepped out into traffic uh, at what was was going to be the wrong time. And a gentleman reached out and grabbed her from the back and pulled her back onto the curb. And uh, that gentleman turned out to be Condé Nast, the real gentleman, not the publishing empire we know that he eventually came to build. Um, he took her upstairs. She ended up modeling for Vogue and then becoming a photographer in her own right. So the picture you see on her left is a photograph that she never preferred and she never really cared for in her life, although it was the one that most people knew her for. Um, as the story goes, this is an apartment in Munich. A, a week or two before this, they had been in another part of Germany, bumped into some other photographic friends, and her, and I believe it was a male counterpart with her, took this shot. Uh, they had been given an address of an apartment on a corner in Munich that was a secret apartment that belonged to Adolf Hitler uh, and Eva Braun. They told them, hey, if it's still there, it's safe. We just came from there. If it hasn't been blown up, go sit in there, relax, and you'll be fine. Sure enough, it was open. Um, and you can see Hitler's portrait there in the bathtub on the left-hand side. I don't know if that was placed there or not. I would feel uncomfortable if I came to Hitler's house and found a picture of him in his own bathtub, but who knows? Um, this photograph sticks with me because of the boots. 
it doesn't matter what type of photography you do, whether it's for fun or whether it's for money. We all know what it's like to reach the end of a hard day, to want to come home and take our boots off, sit in our favorite chair, pour ourselves our favorite cocktail, uh, whatever it may be. It's no different for a woman. It's no different for a war correspondent, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that just always kind of stuck with me. As I studied Lee, I came to understand that because of this relationship with Vogue, she found herself in a lot of places she might not have been in, or maybe some other male counterparts might not have had access to as well. On the left, you see a group of Air Force women that she worked with. She is second from the right, holding that camera there, as you see. And when I mean her having a, you know, a, a look at a world that others might not have, that pilot that you see in the center is Mr. Clark Gable. She was, allowed, she was able to meet people like this who at that time, you know, they weren't going to sacrifice their duty to their country. They came over and they fought too, whether you were a, a sports person or an actor or, you know, whatever kind of famous person. So she had that luxury as well. She also was very, very good at this portrait that you see on the right-hand side, taking pictures of her counterparts uh, at work, at play. This is the photographer, David Sherman. And I just want to break this image down for you for one quick second. Uh, when I first look at it, my, my eye goes to the umbrella and I think, oh, great speech scene, right? But it's not. You realize that's a guy in a military hard hat and a gas mask. And then you realize that's a speed graphic 4.5 camera. So I used to own one of those when I started out photojournalism. It's a, for those who are not aware, it is a plate camera. So it's a frosted glass plate on the back. And the, the negative is four inches by five inches wide and tall. The reason that umbrella is there is because he is trying to focus on a frosted piece of glass in the middle of broad daylight. A lot of us wanna complain about what it is to focus a digital camera or assess an image outdoors in modern times. And a lot of us make complaints, useless complaints, when the fact is those issues have been dealt with by photographers since almost the beginning of photography. Think of the 1800s, that big black cloth that people would throw over their heads so they could focus clearly on that ground glass. Uh, so maybe keep that in mind next time you get frustrated at that LCD on the back of your camera. Life could always be worse. So women who are keeping it pushing, and I guess, this is Lucy, I should say this is right now, because these are some of the women, these are all, uh, not all of them, but many of the women who helped put some things forward for this program. Uh, Jillian Bell is my counterpart in Minnesota. She is a macro wizard, and she is also the person who started and runs single-handedly our EDU program for thousands and thousands of college students across the country. Erica Robinson is out of San Diego. Uh, Eric and I, we, we go back a little farther before either one of us worked at Tamron. Her and I were old friends and we used to work on high volume shooting on cruise ships many, many years ago. We never worked on the same ship, but we always knew who each other was. And then we became friends when we both got off ships. Um, she is very much into travel and she helps run our VIP program as well as getting our, I should say, our, our, when we take VIPs out into the road, but she also, um, she runs some of our, our trips whether around country or out of country to very specific places uh, such as Moab or uh, she took a bunch of people to Cuba, et cetera. Her and I are more from a documentary realm, I guess. Janet Wong, you see here on the right-hand side, she's from Los Angeles. Uh, that smile, she keeps our team together with her jokes and that smile. And she very much is uh, uh, some of the video side of our, uh, of our, I guess, how we run our team. You've been seeing her do Tammy talks and things like that on certain lenses, um, but she is always a ball of fun. And I very much value her input uh, in this industry because she's someone like me who's worked for multiple um, manufacturers out there. Marcy Reef is one of our ambassadors and she's based out of the South here, just South of me in Georgia. Um, the smile you see on Marcy, is the smile you get when she is photographing you because that's how she is. She's naturally infectious. And I gotta be honest with you, I'm a kind of a cranky old guy sometimes. I don't always like people that are overly happy. Um, when I met Marcy, it was because I was tasked with helping her at a trade show with a camera that's connected to a computer, which is connected to a TV. And none of those connections were holding. And I watched her not only keep me calm, which is not good, easy in IT situations like that when there's a crowd watching, but she's also still just keeping it going. She's keeping these people entertained and she's keeping them smiling. And that's how she achieves shots like this. 
uh, she works with a Nikon ambassador named Kelly Beaster, and they they do their own um, workshops around the South throughout the year, predominantly women only. And I've never heard a bad thing come of, of any of those workshops. Alex Kearns is a personal favorite of mine, although I did not put her name forward because Alex actually lives in Perth, Western Australia. Um, as I said, I studied down there. I know Perth very well. Um, I like Alex for a reason most people don't know. Alex was a uh, policewoman for about 15 years. And she saw a bunch of things that she eventually decided she didn't want to see anymore. And instead of letting that get to her, she decided to pick up a camera, use it for the betterment of people, and then well, actually for the betterment of animals, which in turn helps people. And through that, silently began to win a lot of awards, uh, whether they're photographic or cinema based. Uh, she ended up being on some television shows, etc. Here's some examples of why you might see that. This primate on the right has won quite a few awards, even another one just, oh, it was last November, I believe. Even though I think that shot is about two years old. Uh, as for this hairless cat on the left-hand side, I can tell you I'm not a fan of hairless cats, but there is a strength and a power in that photograph. And as a hairless man, if I could find a portrait, someone to take my portrait to make me look that strong, I could want for nothing else. So besides that, she puts her efforts into rescue animals. If you look, that happy little bird on the left actually only has one foot. And this happy little dog on the right, besides being, uh, if I remember correctly, very abused and is three-legged too. It's one of the happiest animal faces I've seen in quite some time. If you're someone who maybe needs a little bit of boost and you're on Instagram, Houndstooth Studio, just find them. When she does post, uh, it was once a week or once every two weeks. It's been, they're coming out of summer. It's getting into cold time down there. So she hasn't been quite as regular yet. Um, and they just had a big cyclone come through. But she will drop uh, eight to 10 photographs that are just sheer happiness, just animal happiness. Like I said, once every once a week or once every two weeks. Uh, so if you need that kind of boost, have a, have a look at her work. Now, I know it's a big jump, Jared. All right. So we went from a Tamron ambassador to Annie Leibowitz. And you're right. I have Annie in here for a very specific reason, as well as someone else that's coming up behind her. Um, Annie was put forward by, by the women that you just saw. However, I kind of knew that she was going to be in here anyways. Uh, and that specific reason I knew that was because when I was in college, I, I one day in class, it was brought up that the top 10, uh, it was when that Andres Gursky picture sold for like 3 million or something in Germany. And nobody, because the first time photography had ever gotten that high. And so the discussion in class was why, or who are the top paid, top 10 photographers in the world? And Annie Leibowitz was the only woman on that list. And that always stuck with me, that frustrated me. Because when we think of Annie Leibowitz on the right, here's a very prime example of her work with Rolling Stone magazine. For any of you who are not aware of this story, I'll tell you real quick. Um, she came over to John's house at the Dakota and the Upper West Side. Uh, went in, her and John were friends, and Yoko too. She said, John, what do you want to do? They hemmed and hawed. He didn't really have any ideas, and he ended up getting naked. You can see his jeans right there in the bottom right-hand corner. He gets on the floor, and he puts his pose. He gets up. They talk for a minute. He puts his clothes on, and they shake hands, and she says, all right, John, I will make sure you're on next month's cover. Thank you so much, and she walks out the door. Five hours later was when John was murdered in front of his house in the Dakota. So Annie found herself in the right place or right time. You know, so this isn't the only famous photograph she had of John Lennon or plenty of other famous people. Um, whereas nowadays, when we think of Annie Leibovitz and Vanity Fair, this portrait you see on the left, or portraits like this are what we have come to know her for, and predominantly of women. And that's absolutely wonderful. You know, she does photograph men, but as I've seen, I think as she's gotten older, she's tried to make women like Susan Sarandon, her, someone she might see as a peer, be a, show them, portray them in as strong as light possible. So anybody, if you're interested in portraiture work, uh, I highly recommend you pick up any of her books. You, they're a little pricey at times, but look at the interplay of color, background, and foreground. Background and subject is what I should say, um, as well as some bodily poses, but a lot of the body poses can, can come from other places. But the way she uses black and white or the way she uses her color tones, uh, are out of this world. 
So putting this together, I got excited because Erica says, hey, I want Lindsay Adario on this list. And I say, I don't know who Lindsay Adario is, but I remember being asked by a young woman at a trade show when I said, what do you photograph? She goes, oh, I take pictures like Lindsay Adario. And I didn't, I felt like I should have known the way she was talking to me. So she's probably America's premier photojournalist at this moment. And she has traipsed across this world. I, uh, I saw a TED talk with her when I was doing research for this. And I got a little surprised. One of the things that she mentioned was that, you know, everybody has this concept that photojournalists are people who just have a death wish. They're all alcoholics and they're just going to want to go run out into bullets. And she said, that's not true. There's a lot of us that actually care and we want to show, you know, what is going on in the world. We want to change it. And so that stuck with me. When I started researching her work, if you go to her website, as you see in the bottom right hand corner, the one thing you will click quickly see is that Lindsay doesn't particularly care that you know anything about her. Her uh, about section is very, very small, uh, if mostly non-existent. What you do see is a uh, long list of galleries of photographs like you're seeing here, very strong work from all over the world. And so uh, I was blown away. First of all, that this caliber of work was just sitting out there for anybody to look, much less borrow for educational purposes. Um, I have no doubt that we've seen her work, whether in our newspapers, magazines, et cetera, but her work kind of sticks with me. This picture on the left, this young girl, you know, you, we see her with a tear in her eye and that might be the first thing that you think and you go, oh, that, you know, that's upsetting. But if you stop and take the photograph in and look through it, you realize she's surrounded by a bunch of strong older women. Um, they don't appear to be crying. They don't appear to look that happy, but you know that this girl is safe. And once you realize that she's safe, you kind of realize that right behind the girl's shoulder is a cedar of Lebanon. So that probably tells you she's somewhere near Lebanon or Syria. And then that also tells you that she probably didn't grow up ever seeing a blonde haired, blue eyed girl, right? Like the doll that she has to carry because it's all that she has. And that always stuck with me. Then contrasted with this beautiful photograph on the right, where we see women in Africa getting to take their own health into their own hands, which is a subject that has uh, greatly not only impacted the women of Africa, but the whole entire world, uh, you know, over the last three to four decades. And it's something that we've, we've all kind of strived for countries, governments, et cetera, to help the continent of Africa. And so there's a lot of strength in that. Even, even this picture on the left where she's embedded herself with the military, that, that picture is predominantly filled with women, right? And she is in that bad place that not everybody wants to be. But when she steps out of that bad place, you see the photograph on the right, right? This is, this is the middle of nowhere. I've tried very hard to find the middle of nowhere many times in my life. And I've come pretty close, but I've never been this far in the middle of nowhere and seen two women with such beautiful dyed um, full headscarves like that, uh, that match this color of the sky. It's just mind boggling to me, the extent that she's willing to go through to put herself in places. And I was very, very thankful to discover that she was now the second woman uh, on that list. It's still, we're still not balanced yet, but we're getting closer, we're getting closer. So who is it now? Who's got it going that isn't a Tamron employee or the world's wealthiest shooter? Um, and so this is where we kick back to kind of post World War II. Actually, we're kind of hearkening to the 60s, the early 60s, uh, sorry, mid 60s. Diane Arbus is a name that many of us do know even though we may not know her whole, whole story. Uh, she had been married to the actor Alan Arbus and living in New York City. And she dealt with a lot of mental demons and depressions. And uh, the way she dealt with this was by using the camera. And she would go to Hell's Kitchen and she would go to Central Park in the late sixties. And she would photograph people on the fringes of society. And that is how she helped work herself through her own problems. Um, unfortunately, that only lasted so long, and in 1971, she took her own life. Lucky for us, in 1971, her youngest daughter, Amy Arbus, was 17 years old. Now, I can't speak to how Amy took her mother's death or how much she might have been a photographer before then, but obviously her mother had affected her, and she went on to produce massive amounts of work for tons of people. I mean, you can see American Express, Saatchi and Saatchi, Nickelodeon, New Line Cinemas, but at the same time, as we see on the bottom right here, she was producing book works 
uh, very similar to the things that her mother would do. The difference being, this isn't that kind of early 70s, bombed out, late 60s, that beginning of, of the downside of New York. This is kind of New York coming out of that. Um, this is the birth of hip hop. This is Jean-Michel Basquiat and Andy Warhol, right? And uh, Grace Jones and people like that in New York City in the 80s. Uh, so if that, that kind of New York kitsch is what you're looking for, her book on the street, or there's a, I think there's one other from this time, a really, really good reads. On the left-hand side is uh, Diane herself, arguably with one of her most famous photographs. And I will leave that up to you guys to look at if you would like to. Uh, that is a young, mentally challenged uh, school child walking through Central Park holding a grenade, is what that is. Um, and that is probably her most famous photograph, I think. Um, so that is uh, Amy and her mother, Diane Arbus. And so now we get to everybody being alive. And Sally Mann is, in my humble opinion, one of maybe America's most slept on fine artist photographers. Uh, that is her on the left hand side with that gigantic bellows camera. Same principle as we talked about with the David Sherman photograph, right? Except on the back of that, that's either going to be a 10, probably a, oh, it's either 8 by 10, or it could be a 12 by 24, or it could be a 12 by 18. I don't know how big that is. I don't have a good perspective there, right? But it's much larger, much larger. So Sally has great representation, you know, across the globe. She has been, been in, in and featured, uh, created herself. Um, a few movies and documentaries, which have gotten her known. And since then, she has kind of come to hide out kind of where she's from, uh, just south of me. I'm here in Arlington, Virginia. She lives down in the bottom of the Shenandoah Valley, just a few hours south of me. And if you were to go to a website today, what you're going to see is these beautiful, really close up portraits of people from the south. And they are done on wet plate colloidian on tin. I believe it looked like tin. Um, amazing, right? Pulling back these old processes from the 1800s. Um, but what she's doing is she's trying to show the South and more specifically, the people of what I would call Appalachia. Um, we're talking West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, um, and Northern Georgia and Western South Carolina. Just as you see these two, you know, this mother and her daughter on the right hand side, always very strong portrait showing Southern life, but there's always a stillness to them. There's not always people in her shots, um, but she definitely does sum up what Appalachian life is like. Um, so if you are into that kind of work or, or fine art, I, I definitely suggest you head to her website. And here's where we get start getting into some smaller bits and pieces of, of who's out there so we can move a little faster. Uh, Megan Dollawall is based out of Mexico City, but she's she is someone who, you, much like others we've spoken about, you've probably already seen some of her photographs in the front covers of your local newspapers or newspapers if you've, I was going to say if you've been traveling, but most of us haven't been. <laughs> um, she's been very curious about how people transit, migratory routes, and things of that nature. So the picture you see on the right is all women because she's She's following those caravans from Guatemala and El Salvador through her country all the way up to the U.S. border. And these are predominantly women and children trying to find a better lives because the men in their in their lives have been killed uh, by gangs. It's a pretty tough call. Um, that's a that's mentally challenging at a minimum to stay in that environment as frequently as she has. Um, Maria Balcazar is a Bolivian American who. For me, it was a whole new spin on the term event photography. Uh, I noticed two things very clearly. One, as you see here from this photograph on the right, an adept, an adept use of black and white. Contrast, clarity, framing, the whole kit and caboodle. Really amazing black and white work. The other thing that quickly came to me was, and this is for the, the event shooters out there, her use of shutter and specifically dragging a shutter, um, just specific amounts during uh, cultural festivals and things like that in many countries throughout South America, and I guess Central America too, uh, she has this way of really showing you not only the color, but the movement and the action and things that are going on. Like, I know my hands are moving around kind of funny in the corner of your screen, but that's really the way I felt looking at her photographs. They move through frames. Uh, so if you're looking for a creative jolt there, I would highly, highly suggest you look into her work. 
Courtney Girard is back here in North America and the United States specifically. Uh, she kind of blew me away because after earning a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a ma uh, she got a master's degree in natural resources journalism. Did you know something like that existed before this class? Because I didn't. And I, I studied photojournalism, right? Um, she really appreciates her world and she knew that from the beginning. She cares about the world, the environment. And very quickly from her photographs, people started to realize that, and she started to align herself with um, similar thinking, similar minded people, and then companies and corporations such as Gore-Tex and Patagonia and Yeti. And she now manages CCAT Creative, which helps companies like that bring their environmental beliefs out in their advertising and their use of photography and, and other creative subjects. Uh, so she's super, super interesting, as well as her own critiques, as you see here on the right of just American life, which is not dissimilar from Amy Toensing, who you see this photograph on the right is, is definitely a critique on American life as well. That is the Jersey Shore. Um, even though this is a picture filled with people, I'm a big fan of the mathematics and photography, the geometry of photography, um, or the, um, we have two men, right? It's a split screen here. Two men holding two drinks with two women behind them. Uh, it's just, it just cracks me up. It's so wonderful uh, to see her viewpoint. And that explains why she has been a regular contributor to National Geographic for quite some time. Besides doing things like this in America, uh, you know, or I know she did a big project on, um, Hurricane Katrina. She's gone throughout the Pacific and Australia as well, documenting all kinds of other societies that are not first world, hence the National Geographic work. Anush Babajanian is someone who is very, in my opinion, she's very important today. Um, Anush is from Armenia, and her whole goal is to help people understand that you might live on the other side of that line over there in Azerbaijan, but we still breathe the same air. We still eat the same food. We still share the same land. And that's the point. And so to put that into more context for you, they you might have heard at the end of last year, there was the nagorno karabakh war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And Armenia is on the west side of that. And its neighbor is Turkey. Turkey hasn't really helped Armenia. And in the meantime, that's all mountainous. That's where the Kurdish people live. Six and a half million displaced people with no country, the largest displaced people on the globe. So it's a rough area, right? It's a rough area where everybody's just living together, but nobody really likes each other or they're trying to figure it out. And so she's won quite a few awards for trying to bridge those gaps um, by using her photography to help people just understand we're all people. And uh, I wish her all the best because I know that is a very difficult task, especially today. Uh, Crystal Wright is an adventure photographer. And the first time I saw her work was actually at a trade show a couple of years back. I rounded the corner of a major manufacturer's booth and I saw a TV screen with uh, a video of Crystal. She was testing out some uh, low light camera gear and she, had, she and a couple friends had carted all this gear and kayaks up into some place in British Columbia, up into this gorge that hardly anybody knows about, that's about three stories tall. And they hiked up, if I remember correctly, it was, they started at lunchtime. So they get there about four o'clock, uh, sun was going down, it's full moon out as well. And so they're, they're doing kayak, three story, five story kayak drops by moonlight. And it was just unbelievable. So as you can see from her photograph here on the right too, uh, she's putting herself in quite a few interesting positions to get her work done. So if stream sports or things of this nature are what you're into, I highly, highly suggest you look into her. Jesse Minot actually functions opposite of most of the people we've spoken about today. Uh, Jesse is the daughter of, of two army service people, I guess is what I should, man and woman. Um, and so she grew up living all over the world. And when she finally came back to the US, she just wanted to stay. And she uses all that, that knowledge that she gained from out in the world to help inform her space and right here where she is with people. And I think that's really, really evident with this uh, beautiful pregnancy photo. I know pregnancy photos are, they come and they go for me, I guess. There's sort of like a stock stereotypical one. And then there are ones like this. And this just kind of blew me away. Um, and I really appreciate her style. Kathleen Clemens is a little bit more established out there. You can find Kathleen when she's not 
um, hanging out uh, halfway up the main coast doing her own work, you can you can catch her doing Santa Fe workshops and things of that nature. Uh, I got interested in her because if you see this this f uh, photograph of the flower, I the only thing I do besides document things is I enjoy a bit of of um, macro work. And at the time I was really kind of getting, it was the it was fall as there were some macro things I've been enjoying. I start seeing her work and I think, well, it's really interesting macro. And it kind of gives you the feeling as though maybe you've photographed through another petal or something that was close to the lens, right? But as you begin to look through her folio, you realize it's not necessarily the case. This is a creative uh, tool that she uses when she is doing this macro. So it can look like a macro shot or it can harken back to people like Julia Margaret Cameron when we have this soft focus that can be used as a paperback book cover, as an album cover, right? As a magazine cover. It can be a lot of different things, the type of work that she does because she is the other fine artist in the group besides Sally Mann. So if this kind of work is something you're interested in, uh, do check her out because you can catch her on East Coast and West Coast. Uh, Katie Peterson is out of Minneapolis and not Minneapolis, sorry, Minnesota. Uh, at first, eh, I'm always a little hesitant. I told you my uh, my background is photojournalism. And so I don't I don't do a ton of editing. If I, I prefer the dark room or what can be done in a dark room, if I'm going to edit things, that doesn't mean I don't think people shouldn't do that. And, and the more I looked at what she did, I really got I kind of excited by it in a few ways. Obviously, the photograph is very, very comical. These, these people are having a baby once again after quite a few years. The daughter's not really having it per se or doesn't really care. Um, I think the, young, the, the gentleman is happy. He's on his motorcycle, right? He'll take that. And as I start to look around, I realize that she's employing a lot of things here. That's a beautiful landscape photograph in the background of Minnesota, right? And this is why she has been winning quite a few upcoming awards and things like that um, right before COVID hit and her business was growing so much that she had to pull her husband in and now they're living out of the studio uh, not completely but uh, they are uh, they've been working quite hard so she is someone to to really note as an up-and-coming photographer and to check out her work Kirsten Lewis is kind of the converse very very established she started out in in North Carolina after getting a BA in child psychology she decided that wasn't quite for her but she picked up a camera and over some time found a developed a new style that kind of took off in the Outer Banks and after about eight years decided she was good she moved herself over to Colorado with her family uh, I don't know the reason but um, once she got there she kind of pushed their, her little project a little farther and now she does this 72 hours in the life of series. And that is how she ends up with amazing family photographs like you see in this bottom right hand corner. Uh, I love that shot. It blows me away. And one of the things that sticks out about Kirsten to me is she is referred to as the photographer's photographer. Um, because, you know, there are plenty of, of people out there in the industry that, that want Kirsten to photograph themselves or their family. And I think that speaks highly for you when your peers I want you to do the thing that everybody knows how to do, right? I, I think that's, um, I think it's really awesome. So that is Kirsten Lewis and her wonderful family style of photography. Ellie Pritz, are you into color? Holy cow. <laughs> you might recognize that as the restaurant in the middle of LAX. Uh, I cannot speak highly enough about Ellie, in all honesty, um, because if there's any woman in this program who's got it pushing, it is these two women right here that we're about to talk about. Um, Ellie Pritz is a woman from Chicago. She started, decided at 19 she was going to go to photography school, and very quickly she realized it was going to be, she was going to do better by leaving photography school and working on her own. And so she started out, she was doing good. She ended up creating an app, the first collaborative photography app called Hippo, where you could work with another photographer. From there, she got noticed by Apple and Apple asked her to come on board because of her color schemes, as you see here, to help launch the first at Apple Instagram campaign. And then from there, she became one of the directors of the shot on Apple campaign or shot on iPhone campaign for Apple. And to be honest with you, what's frustrating most about her is I don't even think she's over 30 yet. I'm not sure because she's already left Apple and now she's created her own, um, she teaches her own workshops and her own marketing agency. And she's bringing up younger women and younger creatives uh, to get them out there. And I just, it's, if there is a feel good story, it is definitely Ellie because 
um, she has just kept it pushing and, and it seems like she just has positive windfall after positive windfall and her work is gorgeous it really really is it is not straight photography but her color use is unbelievable unbelievable so second to last photographer is puna ghana and puna's out of austin texas um as you see there pitchfork rolling stone enemy she is a music photographer and i have a soft spot in my heart for that because i spent many years not making money but enjoying the heck out of life photographing musicians all over asia australia and here in the united states um it's a hard gig i know how hard it is and when i went to her website it it was a rabbit hole it was genuinely a rabbit hole for a couple of reasons one you quickly see that all puna wants to do is shoot it's polaroid it's film it's, it's 35 millimeter it's medium format it's eight millimeter or 16 millimeter cinema film she just wants to shoot it it doesn't matter what it is just give it to her and she'll do it the other thing that stuck with me is she did a lot of behind the scenes work um you know backstage stuff and every one of her images doesn't really show a debaucherous backstage it didn't matter who the artist was and i have some knowledge of some of the people that she was shooting even though it looked a little wild at times, it always looked inviting and fun and safe. And that's not easy to do in the music industry business. So as I was uh, looking through a rabbit hole of good images to add for this program, it was hard. It was extraordinarily hard. Um, but I came across this one and I used this one for a very, very specific reason. That is actually Grace Jones. And for those of you who may not know Grace Jones, um, she started out as a Grace Jones is six foot seven, I think, or six, six, um, beautiful black woman. She started out as a model. She was a, a singer, she's multiple. I have one of her records in my collection right now. She was a Bond villain, villain woman. She was in uh, one of the Timothy Dalton ones in the early nineties. Uh, so in her performances in the early eighties, this, what, they, what she's wearing there, I don't think that was painted directly it is painted directly on her. She has a tube top on, right? But it was painted over it. So that's an homage to Keith Haring, who at her famous Madison Square Garden show came and painted her naked with white, as you see here. Now, at the same time, a few years later, this is why I added the image, the converse happened. Keith Haring painted himself into a white room, uh, with the same kind of drawings but painted black and he was completely entirely naked and he stood there like hunched like this on a chair staring straight down the barrel of this camera in this big wide expanse and that photograph was taken by annie Leibovitz. it just comes back around full circle sometimes and so with that i'm getting you here to the end of the class and this is the last one this is the second woman that i put forward uh, because i am ridiculously passionate about this woman's work personally, as well as the whole story about her. Uh, this is Vivian Dorothy Meyer. And I, for those of you who may not know the full story, I will try and tell you as quickly as I can. Um, she was born in France, up the close to the Swiss border in the mountains. She did not have a lot of family. And at a very young age, uh, she moved to New York City to become a nanny. Uh, I believe she had one family in New York for quite some time. And then she packed up and she moved to Chicago where she be nanny for two families. Um, what she would do is in one of the, the main families that you can see in one of her documentaries, excuse me, the kids say, we don't ever really remember her. She always had a camera, but we didn't remember her taking photographs, but we know she did. And she was always locked up in her room because that's what she asked. She asked for one key that nobody in the house had to that room because she was a pack rat and she didn't want anybody to know this. She saved newspaper clippings, but she would shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. And if she could process the film, she would. If she couldn't, she would store it in boxes. And so all this time goes by. She stops nannying. She continues to lead the solitary life. And in the middle of winter on a street corner in Chicago, she slips and falls very late in her life. And I believe it was in January. She, uh, was taken to the hospital, she was admitted and she had a broken hip, which unfortunately uh, within a month or two, she never fully recovered from and she died of. She died almost the closest you could be to a Jane Doe. No family, nobody knew who she was. And that's what we thought of as Vivian Meyer. Fast forward a couple of years, 
uh, a young gentleman is buying uh, auctioning uh, at an auction for storage unit and buy, uh, buys the storage unit that has since not been paid. She had prepaid three to five years on multiple storage units around the area where she had shoved all of her pack rat film into. This gentleman ends up finding another one. A second gentleman finds a third one. Then as unfortunately happens here in America, lawsuits ensue, who owns what, who can do what. But the good thing about this is they have to show providence. They have to figure it out. So they go back to Europe. They try and find any living relative and they cannot. So the Vivian Meyer Foundation is set up and you can see her work. And it's amazing. It's really amazing to me. One thing is, look here on the left. You see this adept use of the reflection, how she has outlined herself just slightly. I do believe that is New York as she is a little young there. Whereas when we see some of her other work, let's be clear, she shot, uh, if you didn't notice in the other, uh, other shot or the one right here in front of you, you can kind of see this is what we call a twin lens reflex or a two and a quarter camera. So that means the, the negative is two and a quarter by two and a quarter inches square. So this is Instagram before Instagram. On the left, we have this boy in a very banal moment in life. It doesn't mean it's not wonderful. It doesn't mean it's not heartwarming, right? I mean, the, the look on that cat's face makes me happy. Whereas you see these other moments, maybe sometimes she's alone where she does, she uses these reflections to play with herself, to, to play with what, like, what is really happening. These, these comments on society, maybe comments on her life. Um, but she was technically very, very proficient. As she went along, she only got better. And as you can see here, there is this interplay. And this is why I'm as passionate about her work as I am. If you go to the website, vivianmeyer.com, you're going to see and check on, you know, find a folio. It's going to be about five images wide because they're all square. And then it's going to scroll down, not infinitely, but quite some time. Look at all the images. You count how many interplay like this back and forth with each other. Okay. She was a nanny. So she had a way with children. She could get this young girl to look at her, and not be scared. Right. And the young boy didn't care. We have no idea what's out of frame. But in the context of this other photo, which was not taken, most likely, I cannot say this with 100% certainty, but not taken on the same day, not taken in the same city, but they look as though they, they match up. Um, she has this amazing, amazing way of doing it. And so I would highly suggest you look into her if black and white, a really adept use of black and white is your thing, if Americana is your thing. She shot and she shot and she shot and she shot and she didn't stop. I, te the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of images she's left is, is mind boggling, but well worth anyone's time. Uh, whether it's looking at a book or whether it's finding the documentary, find, uh, let me rephrase that. Or whether it's seeing the documentary, Finding Vivian Meyer. Uh, it floats in and out of Hulu and it floats in and out of Netflix. And I highly, highly suggest you do it because I think that she is America's most slept on photographer because she never wanted you to know who she was at all. And with that, as always, I will happily answer any questions. Thank you for your time and support. And please stay safe out there. Uh, we're close to out of the woods, but we're not there yet. So I just hope that you and your family uh, are doing all right. And with that, let me know what I can do for you guys. Uh, and, again, yeah, I'll and you folks, if we got any uh, questions, um, uh, mostly it was comments, uh, a lot of engagement with you, Jared, which I think is great. Um, but any questions, pop those in the chat uh, and we will, uh, we will ask. Uh, yes, this is being recorded for those folks that were asking for a list of all of the photographers that Jared talked about. Um, we do have this recorded, so that's probably the best, best way that we're going to be able to get this uh, back to you so you can see all those photographers again. Um, but uh, a quick pitch, because uh, we didn't do it earlier, um, but today uh, it's, a, I think, a, like an Instagram takeover uh, for one of our Tamron ambassadors, uh, Taylor Brumfeld, or Brumfield, uh, who is uh, an incredible uh, commercial and beauty photographer um, who's uh, going to be on the Tamron Instagram. So uh, if you guys uh, have any time or interest, definitely check her out. Uh, she's incredible. Um, so yeah, uh, any, any questions at all? Uh, are you that thorough, Jared? You're I just am that happy good? to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> and 
that is a, a awesome. well that was so of, good. Uh, and there were questions there was like there was a question earlier and actually another um person answered it and um i think people were mostly just engaged and, and excited yeah. to see some that they recognized and some that they don't everybody mm -hmm. is wondering about the list and the list is is the video um, we know how hard it is to take all of that in during a Zoom, so the Zoom will be provided to everybody who signed up to be here today. Um, that way you can make your own list for the ones that were most interesting to you, because obviously we all have different tastes in what we like to go explore, but I do sure. highly recommend exploring as many of these women and more. Like, I, I can add to your list, Jared, if you if you would like. <laughs> round round yeah. two, I'm going to reach out for you. I, I will. <laughs> I will, because yeah, I'm you would throw them out there. You would be surprised, like, uh, you know, a couple of times ago, I taught this class and somebody said, oh, well, do you know, you know, can you name any, uh, like, who's your favorite BIPOC photographer? And I thought, um, well, I named off a bunch there, right? I, it's not a personal, I, I'm not trying to make it about me per se, but I got kind of confused when they didn't realize that a ton of these people are people of color, right? It's not. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Super good. And well, uh, yeah. what, what, I, got, I had something that I was totally going to say. Uh, somebody else talk because I'm having a break. Uh, well, and, and I got to tell you that your um, the mention of Dorothea Lang reminded me that uh, I had watched, I think it was the Ken Burns Dust Bowl uh, documentary. I love Ken mm -hmm. Burns, everything that guy does. Um, and in the Dust Bowl, he features uh, Doc. Uh, he features a ton of Dorothea Lang uh, photography. And there was one that uh, I remember watching it. I like rewound to, to watch it again because he shows this one photograph and I, I took a screen capture. I'm like, I need to find this because this is an incredible shot. Would love to get a print of this if, you know, just if, if at all possible. Uh, and like starting your presentation again this time, I was like, oh yeah, throw the laying that one shot. And so I like <laughs> immediately went on and started a search for it to see if, uh, and I think I found it. I think uh, okay. something like art.com or art America, one of those that sells uh, some of the old prints might, okay. might have it. So um, the Oakland thanks for the remark. also opened up an archive <laughs> and was doing sales of a number of Dorothy Lang prints that had never mm. um, seen the light of day before. So um, I don't well, know if any of those are still available, but by all means, look into it. They're incredible. I'm glad you said that, actually, because I see Kathleen says, uh, you know, do you have any book recommendations for women photographers? Uh, I love every one of Lee Miller's books, but I think maybe Kathleen is speaking about a book of just like a ton of women photographers. I don't necessarily have one of those. However, I did get notified about a month ago that the High Museum in Atlanta has been running a massive woman-only photographic show for three months. Um, so check the High Museum. They're really, really good. I actually saw the first time I ever saw Leonardo da Vinci's handwriting was at the High Museum. It was his shopping list for getting food and tomatoes and it was wild it was on the back of one of his <laughs> right the high museum is amazing they do high quality work so um they're a great repository for current women photographers and maybe what they might be showing is books attached to that presentation or that show might be beneficial um and and in terms of books i do have some recommendations if anybody's Yo, me, wondering for, that are that that aren't just women photographers, but are there products of women who are photographers? Um, and Sally Mann, who you brought up, one of my absolute favorites of all time, has produced an enormous number of books and they are fabulous. Some of my favorites, um, one, one of my top favorites actually is called At 12 and it's an exploration of those preteen years in, in girls and it's actually really beautiful. Um, and then if you didn't bring her up, Jared, but um, Maggie Taylor, Maggie Taylor is like the non-photographer, photographer, queen of, of Photoshop, um, who was also one of those people who lived in the shadow of her husband for quite some time because it was Jerry Hulsman. Um, and if nobody knows who that is, he was kind of the pre-Photoshop Photoshopper who would use multiple mm -hmm. enlargers and produced single images from multiple negatives. So Adobe yes. approached him and wanted him to try out Photoshop as they were developing it. Maggie was his wife, was in bed actually um, after like a surgery or something. He hated the program so much and she was bored in bed and took off with it and <laughs> become the compositing champion whose work has recently been, <laughs> ended up in a lot of Russian memes stolen by an Italian festival. And uh, she's got a phenomenal story and great books. So those are fine art pieces I highly, highly recommend. Sorry, no. I can keep going. Oh, no, you're good. Ingvar Gertz, 
Oh, Rose, thank you so much. Uh, Ingo is one of a cust our customers at Looking Glass and is an amazing oh. photographer. Rose included a link. Everybody should totally check that out. She is a local um, hero kind of of ours oh. uh, who, who we lost, I believe, within the past year. And uh, so anyway, you can see a lot of her work and learn more about her as well because she's phenomenal. I mean, the list could go on forever. I could just keep, oh, but that does remind me of one thing. I'm sorry, I have to mention this now since we're talking about women photographers. <laughs> um, we have lots more Cameron classes coming up. Most of them are in fact also taught by women photographers. <laughs> um, and so we're gonna see a lot of those. Uh, go to our website and check that out. They're coming up. I think we're doing them on a weekly basis, Ben, is that correct? We are, that is correct. Okay, so you can sign up, they're all free. Also, we have another one coming up with three incredible photographers, Christy Odom, um, Tamara Lackey, and Carol Goosey, the only person to ever win four Pulitzer Prizes for journalism. Um, they're all doing one talk with us um, and it's gonna be so cool. Uh, also, that is free, so please. Keep coming back. We we really want you guys to to join us for all of these things as we continue exploring photography together online. Um, hopefully, keeping the inspiration flowing <laughs> and just some good mood in the midst of all the crazy. Right. Yeah. I just shared the link to um, the Looking Glass page that has the the upcoming uh, classes on it. So. Awesome. Awesome. Ah. <sighs> I think that's it. Unless anybody else has any other specific questions. No, it's all thank yous then. Thank you, Jared, for putting this together. Thank you, everybody. Cameron for making thanks it for, happen. Thanks for being here, right? Yeah. If you're not more, here, we can't learn. Uh, more classes on uh, photo history and the like, please. Uh, actually, uh, Jared's got a couple of videos uh, on the Tamron site back last year when uh, the techs were creating, <laughs> um, uh, creating content um, you know, for the dealers and just on the Tamron website when, you know, we couldn't do this all in person. Um, I think this has probably preceded the webinar uh, burst a little bit, but uh, if you go on the uh, Tamron website, he's got some videos on there um, discover, or, or discussing uh, like top five uh, important images in like in history. Oh, yeah. um, that was an incredible video. Um, a couple, you know, photography history ones that uh, are, are really great. So if you liked this and you want more, uh, you can go there, but uh, the we, also should, does them. we should just uh, pressure Jared to do more of these. <laughs> Give us more of these. Tell my bosses it's okay, and I'm happy to do it. <laughs> I, I love it. I'll keep coming. I'm so nerd. I love it. The history, Same. the books, all the stuff. Mm -hmm. Bring it on. I, I kind of live for it a little bit. I Thank like you, looking everybody. at our legacy, right? Thank you. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Right on, guys. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, shop local. Buy some Tamron stuff. So we can keep this going and uh, everybody have a phenomenal day.